Hey, do you think that they made this into the horror film? Emily Rose? I just... Well, it is frequently assigned to students to teach them about Southern Gothic literature. Yeah, that's definitely pretty apparent. (laughs) All right, A Rose for Emily is Faulkner's first nationally circulated short story. And whether you are a first-time reader or you're here for your William Faulkner certificate, we welcome you. Let's talk about the ending and how that could haunt your dreams for days or years. Or six months, depending on how often people <laughs> see you, right? <laughs> well, and also depending if Faulkner's writing your story, then you never know how long it's going to take. <laughs> <laughs> True that. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And do you have a rose for crypto? Now, if you are new here, we go heavy into detail on the short stories that we read, really bringing them out and offering some literary interpretations and criticisms. If you are down for that type of a discussion, please consider hitting that subscribe button for joining us on the journey. And as we always start off, let's look at the publication info. You can read this for free, and we'll put a link down in the description below as well. This was published on April 30th, 1930 in an issue of The Forum, and might be one of probably Faulkner's most accessible pieces, and one that we may recommend for you being the first outing into the foyer of Mr. Faulkner. Interesting fun fact here, this piece was rejected in 1929 by Scribner's. Now, if you are new to Faulkner, there's a few warnings that we need to kind of get out of the way. We are in Yakna Patafa County, okay, a fictionalized county created off of William Faulkner's experiences, and it's through this county where you see reoccurring characters, reoccurring themes, that William Faulkner really got his writing legs and started to kind of grow as a writer into this world. We've read many, many stories in this universe, we've read many of his novels, and we're now getting to what is arguably his most famous short story piece. So as we've read through many of these novels, one thing that you have to note is that his work has a lot of racist themes in there. There's some rough language. Uh, We see the N-word dropped in here as well, just like we see in some of his other pieces. A few things also about his writing is he has like really long sentences. They almost feel like run-on sentences. So these are things that you're going to have to be accustomed to as you read Faulkner. Yeah, I think this story is what, six sentences? (laughs) <laughs> so I think that's it, right? <laughs> Six sentences turned into 12 pages. <laughs> All right. So the first question I think most people have is what's up with the name of the title? They did mention some rose colored lights and stuff at the end, but why call it a rose for Emily? Whether you believe him, that's another thing. But William Faulkner has been quoted that this was meant to be his gift to the Southern lady, the Southern woman that kind of that that was of Emily Grierson's status. And we're going to go into that and really break down the kind of maybe what Emily is meant to kind of represent and what Faulkner viewed as the Southern Belle and how the Southern Belle was maybe not portrayed the most accurately in a lot of Southern literature. One thing that we always like to point out here when reading Faulkner is that a lot of his stories are non-linear narratives, so we jump around in time a lot. This is a trait that Faulkner tends to use quite often in his stories. So we'll start off almost at the end of the story and then go in reverse chronological order here as it moves backwards in time. And the reason why that's important is it's not that it just skips around, but it's a way of Faulkner making characters face the past and how the past decisions impact the present. And it's through this that he's able to explore that. One of the things that Faulkner really always likes to write about is the changes that are taking place in the South after the Civil War. So we're in a time period that the South has lost the Civil War and it's being brought back into the United States. And we have this big change taking place of the old way of doing things where it's dominated by the ownership of land, slavery, and these old Southern ideals now being forced into something new because the North has taken over and kind of is is changing their whole society. Right. And then further on that context here, we have some examples where Sartorius made Emily exempt from taxes, right? And we're going to explore that. But a very throwaway line there was they talk about how the black women had to wear aprons, which would have been illegal to make that a thing in the United States at this point in time. So he's specifically playing up some of the ways of holding on to the old ways of life in the story. Another thing about the South that is very prevalent here is the idea of a Southern belle. And this was the idea that a man was to protect a woman and protect her virtues. And sometimes the Southern way of thinking is that you would break a law or you would break any commandment in order to protect the virtue of a Southern lady. Well, it's the idea of using that virtue as a lever into an end, right? It's the means to the end. To protect this Southern belle, I might go kill a black person or, or, you know, that sort of thing. It was a way of control and power that Southerners used at this point in time. And the Southern belle was an excuse to enact it. Exactly. 
And our final point is I want to talk about her mental illness. And I think this is done very well. We got some quotes later on. And if that seems like a lot, well, let me quote Diana Brown Jones, who remarks, the critical canon of A Rose for Emily has become as bloated as the character herself. <laughs> <laughs> So let's kick off with our plot, and we're going to break this into different sections, and in section one, we're going to start off with the opening line of the story. When Miss Emily Gearson died, our whole town went to her funeral. The men threw a sort of respectful affection for a fallen monument. The women mostly out of curiosity to see the inside of her house, which no one save an old manservant, a combined gardener and cook, had seen in at least 10 years. So the very first thing we know, the very first sentence spoils the whole story, and I love it because we know our main character is already dead. So that's why you'll see this kind of plays in the reverse chronological telling of the story. And we'll time skip backwards to lead up to Emily in her younger years. And so we see the last events of the story here right at the beginning and move towards a younger Emily. And it's worth noting, you'll notice, our whole town went. Our. The narrator is using collective pronoun. So the narrator is not only a member of the town, he's speaking or she is speaking for the town. It's the story kind of tells it through a collective knowledge of here's what we see of Emily. We're voyeuristically watching this Emily Grierson go about her life. The story here really could be viewed even more than just being out of order. You could say arguably that the eulogy here is a reminiscence of a person's life. And it's a way for all these people to discover, you know, about loved ones. And one of the main things you go through are the five steps of grief. And the very first one is loss. As we move through the story here, one thing that we have to talk about is the house itself, as it almost plays an essential character in the story. It was a big, squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with couples and spires and scrolled balconies in the heavily lightsome style of the 70s. An eyesore among eyesores. I really think Faulkner here is not only describing Emily, but really the South as well, and how that slavery and racism and all these things are a sore on the Southern mentality or the, the, the Southern way of life. Yeah. And it's also worth pointing out that what does a big, big house represent in the Southern way of life? Land defines who you are. The more land or larger your plantation is, the more power and influence, respect in the South you had. So with the town wanting to come check out the house, the women to see how they lived, this is also implying that they are a little bit more upper class than perhaps other people are in the family. On top of it being land and power, it's also wealth and a class status as well. It's really quite brilliant in this opening paragraph how much information we're getting about these characters in the story but you have to know a lot about the southern way of life to really dig into that yeah for being such a short piece he really does paint a pretty beautiful narrative here we know a lot about emily we know uh, what she looks like and we know that she's an artist and that'll come into play it, it, it's pretty incredible what he's able to accomplish in such a short piece all right so taxes are due we are now in a flashback 10 years prior to her death and we learn that emily doesn't have to pay taxes her dad when he died left her with nothing Right, and Sartorius, playing up the trope of the Southern Belle, wants to kind of protect her a little bit. He makes up this lie that she's just not going to have to pay taxes. Yeah, and I think what he's trying to talk about here is maybe big government versus little government or state government versus the federal government. And she's saying, no, I'm not going to pay for these taxes. I'm not going to pay what the big man is telling me what I have to do. I have my state rights. Well, this is also an example of past decisions, right? Since Colonel Sartoris made this decision that she wasn't going to have to pay taxes, you see how the new board of aldermen, Jefferson boards of aldermen, are suffering from this decision that Sartoris made. And Emily, all she says is, well, go talk to Sartoris. He'll set you straight, even though he's been dead already. <laughs> yeah, and we see that, you know, future generations are always going to have to, you know, face the issues of past generations. And we have the quote, in reply, a note on paper of an archaic shape in a thin flowing calligraphy in faded ink. So notice the usage of the archaic and faded ink. This is talking about Emily's going to be kind of a, a representation for the old South the way things used to be, the way it's fading out in time. That's Emily in the story. And you'll also notice, to help cement that too, we have some references to dust every time we're talking about Emily. You'll see dust continually come up. And what does dust settle on? Stuff that doesn't change, stuff that remains the way it used to be. And then thirdly, they also bring up the generations are facing this problem where they specifically call out multiple generations and the the guy from the new generation is coming to face Emily with these taxes. This is clearly a discussion of multiple generations and talking to the old South, which didn't want to change their ways, even though they lost the war and the new South rules coming up. 
and he does end up leaving without getting to collect any taxes from her. So she is able to hold on to that. And I think that we see that the South is able to still hold on to some of the things, even though they have lost and they are experiencing some changes. The Southern Belle trope that these women are still going to be protected still holds slightly true. I think what is Faulkner is trying to mention here. Only a man can invent it and a woman to believe it. It's a very gender. uh, That's not a very gender neutral statement. And that's talking kind of almost to that trope of the Southern Belle as well. But I think that also kind of traps her a little bit, doesn't to your to your point on on, uh, madness. Yeah, I think the isolation and I think a lot of the state, the southern states after the Civil War and Reconstruction era feel isolated and it drives them to do things that they wouldn't normally have done. Good people doing maybe bad things. And uh, I think that that can be said of Emily as well as she's pushed to maybe do things that she might not have normally done. All right, the quote to wrap up chapter part one. Alive, Miss Emily had been a tradition, a duty and a care, a sort of hereditary obligation upon the town dating from that day in 1894 when Colonel Sartoris, the mayor, he who fathered the edict that no woman should appear on the streets without an apron, remitted her taxes, the dispensation dating from the death of her father on into perpetuity. So, so much is there is what we've just kind of talked about, right? In, in one sentence, he jams in the racism of passing a law that can't even be passed with that, that the women had to appear on the streets with an apron. The fact that he is protecting the woman that needs protection in terms of Emily not getting any of her inheritance, the inheritance being a representative of the Old South and plantation being the big way of life, on into perpetuity, perpetuity meaning the future generations are going to have to deal with this problem as well. All of, those gen- all of those issues wrapped up into one sentence here. Let's take a moment here to realize that sometimes literature you need to slow down and really parse out to understand. Especially when that was half the story right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so section two, 40 years ago, so 30 years prior to the tax collection event, there's this terrible smell emitted from (laughs) Miss Emily's house, and the town is appalled. What could it be? And I quote, it's simple enough, he said, send her word to have her place cleaned up. Give her a certain time to do it in, and if she doesn't, damn it, sir, Judge Stevens said, will you accuse a lady to her face of smelling bad? (laughs) So the next night after midnight... It's fun. It's humorous, right? It's okay to laugh at this piece. This is a fun piece. But it's also calling out the problem of, do you tell people of their problems, specifically a woman, right? The women in the Southern Belle trope must be protected from a gender perspective. So I'm not going to tell her that her house stinks, right? The the house also being a representative of what a a woman takes care of in, in the Southern older view of life. Definitely, yeah. So we, we, we see here the town being very cautious of, you know, attacking Emily and her estate and her family because they, they, want to, they want to protect her still. So the villagers do go to the house eventually. And what do they see when Emily opens the door? They see Emily there. And in the silhouette behind her, her father, when her father's dead at this point, this is meant to be kind of representative of that oppression that we see, right? Her father did things such as not allowing her to date men, telling her what to do. And here we have his silhouette looming over her. You're going to see in this story that danger looms behind Emily in the form of the past haunting her, right? I think this is where you really start to get a feel for the story is taking that gothic turn. Because up to this point in time, it doesn't feel very, you know, ominous, right? But now you're like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Well, and this further, I mean, I, I, we, we got to keep bringing up these points, right? Emily's not facing her past. She's the old South that is not facing up to the issues that have haunted her. Yeah, to furthermore that, we have the quote, Miss Emily met them at the door, dressed as usual and with no trace of grief on her face. She told them that her father was not dead. And so when her father passes away, she won't accept that he's he's gone. And the town's all like, hey, your place reeks. Let us in. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that that speaks maybe to some of her mental illness problems as well, that she was dependent on him for everything. And that as we see the story progress, maybe he was protecting the town from her or was she being protected because he was super controlling the way that the South controlled their slaves, their people. So there's kind of two different ways you can take this. Mm, That's a good point, because this is the collective knowledge of the town. Right. This isn't even necessarily Faulkner's view or reality. This is how the town viewed, oh, poor Emily. Right, right. So in part three, we start to learn about Emily and the infamous Homer Barron, a potentially lower class Yankee 
coming down to the south. Yeah, so it's very important to note that Homer is from the north, and he is uh, coming down to help build infrastructure, and he is what we would call a carpetbagger. And what's a carpetbagger? So the carpetbagger are northerners that will come down to the south during the Reconstruction era, where the north is dumping millions of dollars and resources into rebuilding the south because of all the destruction after the Civil War. And so he's coming down to literally lay sidewalks and get a job and make money because of this investment of the federal government. Right. And in today's standards, when you see them building sidewalks, they'll have these big machines. Back then, you had men with axes. It was literally back-breaking work to break up the ground. And it's worth noting, too, here also the narrator, we talked about them dropping the N-word. They dropped the bad N-word here as well. And it's the only time the narrator does it. And you'll notice that the narrator is speaking of lower class individuals, the people that are coming down to rebuild infrastructure, which is what Homer Barron is representing as well. So as the story moves forward, we then eventually have old Miss Emily here go to a pharmacist to buy (laughs) poison. And she specifically asks basically for the most lethal poison, and she ends up buying arsenic. And so this may seem a little bit uh, ominous at first. There's actually a pretty cool underlining meaning here, again, where we've talked about the Southern Belle and someone having to protect her almost from herself. Right, because she's like, give me that arsenic. And and the, the druggist is like, that's enough to kill an elephant. What do you need this for? Because if you're getting arsenic, I need to write it down. And she just takes it and he's like, and he protects her by writing four rats on the bottle, even though she never really claimed what it was for. I just totally picture the Southern Belle in her entire dress with her gloves and her hat and her little umbrella and just kind of looking up, you know, right at the bridge of her hat and just staring him the evil eyes right yeah. into him. And he's like, okay, okay, you get it, <laughs> right? Yeah. You could totally see how this went down. Well, and not only that, he mentions that it's a new, it's a law that he has to you know proclaim that and assuming it's a new because he's bringing it up now once again the old south not bowing to the new south way of life right yeah not wanting to succumb to you know again being pressured into this from an outside entity and it's also worth noting out earlier about your point about the eulogy this is the town recollecting this event why did the town tell this event and it never specifically calls out how this ties into the end that's up for you to the reader to kind of draw that conclusion and kind of fill in the dots but the town thinks that this is important to tell this part of the story to make sense of what happens at the end or the beginning of the story if you will as we enter into part four of the story we see that the town is very much anti emily and homer's relationship they think that he's not the marrying type and whether you see the subtle hints that he may be a homosexual that offends them or that he's a yankee and that he's not good enough for miss emily it's never really described specifically but they definitely don't like this they don't like them together walking around unchaperoned and then they actually get the 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 minister involved who tries to talk some sense into her and he ends up failing and and not convincing her to not you know basically coot with with homer well they even send the baptist minister when she's episcopal right (laughs) and uh eventually they write to the uh, family in alabama it was uh, we need some help we can't just let Emily, the spinster woman, run around with this man, potentially sleeping with him. We don't know, but it's a it's a town outcry to be doing this to our way of life. She needs to be married, and this is, again, putting that trope of the Southern Belle. She needs to be protected by a man. She needs to be shielded by the marriage, if you will, by having a man to protect her is kind of the idea here. Yeah. And so what does Emily do? She chases off her nosy cousins because she's a strong, independent woman now that her dad is dead. And she starts buying toiletries for Homer. And everybody's like, oh, okay, well, maybe they're going to get married and this won't be so bad. But then basically they drop off the face of the planet and nobody sees Homer anymore. And she disappears for like six months. I like this quote here but over the six to seven years, right? We have this quote, When we next saw Miss Emily, she had grown fat and her hair was turning gray. During the next few years, it grew grayer and grayer until it attained an even pepper and salt iron gray when it ceased turning. And it's worth noting that we we will point out that iron being described as her hair, right? Faulkner loves to use metal, particularly iron, to describe someone's heart. Someone who's unfeeling might describe it as iron-hearted. And that's a very specific thing that you'll notice. Emily, okay... The town's view of her 
is that she's starting to become more reclusive. We haven't seen her for six to seven years. She just sends the manservant out to go get food for her. Her hair started turning gray and iron-like as she's unfeeling because the town now feels disconnected from her. Yeah, one thing that she used to do is she used to teach artistry and pottery and stuff, and now she's no longer doing that. She's closing herself off from the world and not teaching her pottery classes. Well, I think they even said she closed off her front door and people were only admitted through the back. Right. And in terms of literature, yeah. we saw this also with Absalom. Absalom, the front doors closed is, is shutting off an un- unwelcoming presence. The back door typically represents secrecy, back door dealings. Right? Yeah. So what secrets are going on in that house? And that kind of loops us back to almost the beginning of the story of the ladies want to get in there and see what's been going on in this house because nobody's been admitted <laughs> for years. And the last major thing to note here is how they that she won't let them address her house. Yeah, and I love that. I think, again, it's just it's her sticking it to, I'm not going to conform to these dang Yankees and how they're going to be forcing their ways and giving me a number, you know, and it's something that we don't even think about. We all have social security numbers, right? We're given a number literally by the government, but she's not having it. She's sticking to the old Southern ways. Right, and it goes back to your point earlier about not accepting the state-funded things. Uh, because I think in small town America, it was like 1902 that kind of became standard. And this is well after 1902. So Jefferson's a little behind the times with their southern way of life, not moving on, accepting the new ways of life, accepting being numbered, if you will. It's, it's a very subtle the way they have all these little plays on new systems coming in and ignoring them. And I think it's not just a southern trope as well we do see that because Faulkner is talking about you know age as well and that she is an older lady and that maybe it's sometimes a little bit of ageism here all right so with part five here we have the idea of this being a funeral eulogy and we get all together to kind of get the gossip of what's going on with Miss Emily and now we start to have the real hardcore horror aspect of this story to come about with the gruesome stuff that had been going on in the house that nobody knew about Welcome to Southern Gothic literature, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so Toby, 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 Tobe, which I think is interesting because uh, does that name, do you think that name was an allusion to anything? I definitely think so. So if you say it Toby, that is a very famous name that Kunta Kente, the very famous uh, individual from Roots that Alex Haley wrote about his great, great, great grandfather, uh, took the name Toby when he was forced into slavery. Yeah, I had a feeling about that too, because very specifically, this is after slavery ended, right? And when slavery ended, some some of, some people stuck around and they didn't know what to do. They didn't have the, what they thought was either the skills, the confidence, however you want to take it. They didn't know how to move forward. So what do they do? They just keep basically being a slave for some people. And Toby kind of represents that in a little bit the way that even his hair was turning gray and he just constantly served Emily throughout all these years. Yeah, we have the quote, he talked to no one, probably not even to her, for his voice had grown harsh and rusty as if from disuse. So we have the word rusty then again, kind of referencing a metal, but also that Toby here, he may not know how to read or write. I mean, he can't even talk really anymore. So he's just going to keep on keeping on with what he's always known and comfortable with because... People don't like change. Right. And if you don't have a voice from disuse, arguably you could say that this this man has had no voice for many years in the same way that the slaves never had any voice, right? Yeah. And I think it's just that idea that he's comfortable here. And if he leaves and escapes to the north or, I mean, the slaves just ended. So it just goes to the north. What does he do? Where does he go? Right now with, with Emily dying... And then we're going upstairs to find out what's in that attic. Uh, He don't want to be around to find out (laughs) what might be taken out of him. So where does he flee? Out the back. The back door. And so she died, fell ill in the house filled with dust and shadows, with only a doddering man to wait on her. So again, we see the usage of dust, like we were talking about earlier, where Emily is unchanging Dust sits on things that don't change Emily's old way of life. I love the twist here at the end where we finally see that Emily is not this pure Southern belle and that she is the Southern tragedy. She is the sin. (laughs) Yeah. And I think you can even see a little bit of that mental health stuff that you're talking about here, right? Yeah. And the town was kind of help covering it up, right? They were the ones that, you know, the father was maybe protecting the town from her. And now the town realizes, oh, Emily might have ended up killing maybe her father, uh, maybe Homer, because when they finally get into the house, they see that Homer is dead in the bedroom. And what do they find next to Homer in the bed? Good old Emily. Well, it's a gray hair, but you got to assume that Emily's hair was there. 
And it's very, it's depicted very beautifully in a sense too, like a tragic beauty of the way that he's been in bed and probably Emily's been cuddling with him in some way, shape, or form. Dare I say, some people may question necrophilism here. That it, to come back to that the idea that she was an artist from from the pottery and the artistry, she created this scene for them too, right? He wasn't the marrying type. So there's a lot of different ways that we can interpret that. And if, if you'll allow me, look, maybe let's walk through a couple of those interpretations. Most people who are approaching this want a concrete answer. And that's what literature does is it allows us to explore different meanings based on maybe different ways we view humanity. Right. So one of the ways that I took this is that the father was actually protecting the town from Emily, that he knew that she might have not been a good person or maybe not evil per se, but that she had some type of mental illness, schizophrenia, and that the ending kind of suggests that maybe even she's a necrophiliac and he doesn't want her, you know, sullying his good name and you know, their legacy in the South. And he protects her and, you know, hoards her away from the whole world. And then one once she di- he dies, there's nobody, you know, to protect Emily, but then at least become codependent as well. And now she needs a man in her life and Homer maybe won't marry her because he's a northerner and he, you know, wants to move on just to make money. And so she's like, well, I'm going to kill him and stuff him and put him in my bed. So I'll always have a man for me. You're, you're, you're doing the interpretation where Homer was the surrogate of the father. Right. She always needed a man, yeah. kind of the reverse Southern Bell trope of a man to protect her. She wants a man to protect her in a sense. She's using Homer's corpse as the surrogate now that her father's gone and was right. And, and the father was taken away from her. Right. She didn't want the father gone. She's like, no, no, my dad's not dead. Go away. <laughs> yeah. And I think that a lot of times that happens to many of us where we are forced to believe something. We finally start to believe it. And Emily believed that she needed a man in her life to protect herself. Right. And another way I know some people have interpreted this is Emily, who has constantly been a a symbol of the old South, is holding on to her old old way of life. She is holding on to home and Homer as a way of holding on to her past life or, you know, with her father, that it's a way of holding on to the previous ways of life as well. Now, let me ask you a, yeah. another question to go off on a tangent that we, I noticed you didn't bring this up. Um, what race was Homer Baron? Oh, interesting question. Right. Uh, I would assume that he was white. Okay, interesting. Because here's here's a line, and I'm just curious how you take this. When he was described as a Yankee, big, dark, ready man. And don't forget that he came in with a lot of the black folk that were described as the N-word, as in lower class black folk as well. Oh, okay. And yeah, don't so forget I guess the, that... town, the town was extremely outraged at their relationship. Could it have been a racial reason for why they were outraged on top of the marrying type? Could he have been mixed race? Whether you're one sixteenth, one eighteenth, it didn't matter. If you had any black blood in you at this point in time, right? You were considered a lesser than a hundred percent white person in according to Southern Jim Crow. Well, a lot of America, a lot of America was racist, right? I don't want to say it was just the Southern way of life, but it was particularly highlighted in actions in the South, I should say. No, that totally makes sense, especially since the only use of the N-word in this story is around him. That definitely makes sense. And that maybe this is her way of also getting back at her father and be like, well, I'll show you, you know, I'm going to have uh, a, a, you know, a black man in my life. That's definitely a, uh, a consideration. I like that. Right. right. Now, a lot of people will ask, did she kill him with the arsenic? And I just have a hard time entertaining anything, but yeah, I mean, sure, it's not called out. No, of course not. This is literature, and we have the town, it's the town's perspective, it's not Faulkner's, but the town is putting out this fact that she bought arsenic for no reason, wouldn't admit why, and when this man would marry her, in the same way that her father always took control of her life, now she's free, right? She's her own woman, her dad has passed and moved on, and here's this man that tells her no. This might be Emily's first time in her life taking control as well, where she kills, serves him arsenic because, I mean, I don't, don't go into my Google history or anything, but (laughs) arsenic (laughs) is tasteless. So it actually is a good poison for killing human beings in the sense of uh, kill rate, basically, right? 
So let's end the video there because I'm scared <laughs> of my life. <laughs> Not to be creepy, but my point being is that this is kind of Chekhov's gun of if there was no point for the, the arsenic or that scene, it didn't need to be in the story. So you're meant to assume Emily most likely was planning to kill him. Yeah, it, it doesn't serve any other purpose of perpetuating the story forward or providing any more information about Emily mentally unfit or, you know, her the Southern Belle. It has one purpose in the story so that when you discover that Homer is dead at the end of the story, you're like, ah, I got it now. All right, and one last interpretation that I think might be more of a modern interpretation is that Homer was gay. We had that quote that he likes men and he's not the marrying type. Does that necessarily prove that he was gay? No. This was a time where saying he likes men could mean that he liked hanging around with men more so than women, but not necessarily in the homosexual way. So can you take it that way? Sure. Take it. Take the interpretation any way you want. This is literature. This is meant to bring out what are the parts that we see in ourselves or in others. Particularly Southern Gothic literature, you go to some dark and gruesome places, maybe where sometimes our souls think and, and dream about things that we don't want to talk about. Literature gives us that space to kind of explore that and maybe even kind of understand some feelings that maybe other people have gone through. Yeah, this is definitely made into some horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move into our wrap-up and ratings where we give you an analytical rating of what we think this was just to break down from an analysis perspective as well as just a inspectional read perspective. What did we think about this from just reading it for pure, pure fun and pleasure? I have the both the same score here this time because, one, as I said before, it makes me laugh. you got to get a good score. I love how I described. I know it, it's harsh, but... For me, it was funny at times the way he described the people and how it came to be, and I love the twist at the end. Uh, give it a solid nine for my enjoyment, and then for analytical, I love any time we go to Yakov Hanafa and we get to learn more about the South and how Faulkner views the South and how it's changed or not changing and reluctant to do so. So mine, solid nine. Bam! Bada boom, bada boom. I'm going to go with the 9.5 for both of my ratings. This is clearly one of Faulkner's superb, most best, well thought out, highly interwoven textual pieces that I just I find it every time I come back to it, I enjoy it more and more. I've always felt uncomfortable with it, but I think you're supposed to feel uncomfortable with it. I think it's okay for you to have this eerie, almost haunted feeling at the end with what Emily did to, to Homer. And I think it's okay and eerie to think about this from a eulogy perspective about remembering our lives and how the past kind of haunts us. I, I just really like what it what it tells me as a person and what, what I see in other people. In this. And how the, ha the past will come back to haunt you. Well, all right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on our literature discussion today, A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner. If you're down for literature discussions like this, or if you're along on the journey to see this William Faulkner certificate and what that's all about, please hit that subscribe button. Hit the links below for the William Faulkner certificate program if that's what you're looking to check out more information on. Una out. Peace. <laughs>